Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics, or welcome back. It's nice to see you all here. Uh, so this is the third webinar already of our third Crash Course series, and the series is on Big Tech. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. You can say something about who you are, where you're based, about your research or activities, and what brings you here to Crash Course. So I myself, I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute, TNI, in Amsterdam, and I'll be your host today. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. He also researched big tech, actually, in that role. And behind the scenes, we have uh, Jeremy Krollsmith, our web developer, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl, and Jenny Pannenbecker, who's a communications officer at SOMO. And they're working very hard behind the scenes to make this webinar a success today. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Crash Course, uh, about um, how we actually came to be. So we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from numerous uh, organizations. And we united at the start of the Corona crisis because we wanted to understand what's happening uh, around us um, to reflect a little bit on the challenges we face and also to think of possible solutions. And our Crash Course is a platform which is designed to open up the debate um, and we want to discuss with you how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. In order to do so, we invite uh, global experts from all over the world to break down uh, complex, mainly uh, economic or financial issues and also make them accessible to you uh, so that we can uh, reflect on solutions together and think of how we want to shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. So the goal is to democratize knowledge and to give you the necessary tools to change the world. So this time uh, we decided to discuss uh, challenges related to uh, some of the big COVID crisis winners, which are apart from big pharma, also big tech. Um, and there will be at least five and hopefully six webinars in this series. Uh, every two weeks and uh, we started uh, a month ago so um, we still have three more episodes uh, to come and in each webinar uh, we're providing you with one hour crash course with a special guest on a specific subject uh, that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a little bit better if you miss any crash course or if you want to watch it again you can watch all webinars because they're being recorded and they're put on our website which is crash course economic economics.org so uh, also of this webinar there will be a recording a podcast version as well and a summary and our former speakers our guests Keen Birch and Cecilia Ricap are already there online uh, Rodrigo can I pass on to you yes uh, thank you Sarah so uh, this third series uh, will focus on big tech uh, monopoly power and uh, democracy um, so as Sarah already mentioned, uh, we had two previous guests, uh, Keen Birch and Cecilia Ricap, uh, both provided uh, a solid framework to understand the rise of big tech firms, their business model, uh, uh, and they introduced key concepts that we will need, uh, such as uh, rents and intangible assets. Um, in this series, we will now be moving more towards discussing ways to regulate the sector, big tech. Uh, the different aspects, uh, the problems in trying to regulate this sector uh, and how to provide a, a counterbalance. Um, in a recent SOMA report I co-authored, uh, we provide an overview of the different power dimensions of big tech that we will need to confront. So one of these dimensions um, is their unmatched financial firepower. That is their ability to purchase other firms uh, to disrupt and to dominate other sectors. So just a few examples. Um, some research that we did in our report, it shows that the combined cash pools, the financial reserves of big tech firms uh, at the end of 2020 uh, were $631 billion. Uh, the large big tech firms from the US, so Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet, each um, had a market capitalization of over a trillion dollars. So uh, these markers, they clearly show the extent of the financial firepower of these big tech firms and uh, that it is unrivaled. And the chances 
of um, yeah, new platforms to mature and to remain independent and to have a, well, a, um, a healthy environment of many different firms uh, yeah, is, is increasingly limited as we have these massive, uh, dominant, massively dominant uh, big tech firms. So um, this is, this is, these are the problems that we need to confront. It is the, the, the profitability of these firms uh, that comes at the expense of others. They're unlimited financial resources and their, mo and their business model that revolves around dominating and domination. Uh, and so from these problems, we need to think of how to regulate it. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thank you so much, Rodrigo. That's very uh, enlightening. Um, now, more practical, um, after this introduction, uh, Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker. Uh, and she will uh, give a presentation for about 15 minutes. Thereafter, uh, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions for the, our speaker, uh, which will last another 15 minutes, more or less. And then finally, we'll have a round of questions from your side. So if you have any questions, um, please uh, note them down and you can put them in the uh, special Q&A tab, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. If you like a question, you can endorse it by putting a thumbs up. And in that way, most endorsed and likable question uh, then uh, pops up uh, at the um, top of our screen. So all together, this will be more or less uh, one hour. So we will finish at five o'clock. So now, Rodrigo, you have the honor, I think, to introduce our speaker. Yes. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I would like to introduce uh, Pharmacial. She is an economist. Uh, she holds a, a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, a very inspiring place uh, at the heart of London. Um, she is a senior policy and advocacy officer at Eurodat. Uh, in the previous series, we already had two uh, researchers from Eurodat. Uh, in addition, she is also a, a research fellow at the Global Development Institute at the, at the University of Manchester. Um, and she is a steering group member uh, of the Association of Heterodox Economics. Um, so I would like to uh, invite Farva to put on her camera and to give her presentation. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you so much, Rodrigo and Sara and all the Crash Course team for having me. Uh, I followed this series for a while now. It's very interesting, um, and I the topics are very diverse. I'm and I'm very happy to be here. Um, just before I start, I just want to emphasize that I'm here today as part of um, the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Although I am based also at Eurodat, uh, but this is um, an academic paper that I'm working on. Um, so yeah, that is my affiliation. I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. But so you still need to go to, I think, uh, full screen mode with your presentation. Yeah. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about platforms and the limits of competition policy. And I will try to build on um, the previous series, uh, of course, focusing on intellectual monopolies and how they pose a challenge for um, competition policy. This is the talk outline for today. So I will start with a brief overview of competition policies in general. I will then move on to explaining what is different about contemporary tech monopolies. Um, and for me, uh, platformization is a better analytical lens to look at intellectual monopolies. Uh, and based on that lens, I will look at uh, recent developments in the EU competition policy, basically looking at the new act on um, the DMA, Digital Markets Act. Um, and finally, I'll correlate um, some of the findings, um, some of the, uh, the policies uh, uh, introduced in the DMA of 2021 and how uh, it affects uh, rent-seeking platforms. And then I will conclude with some trends and some limitations. So let me start by a very brief uh, definition of competition policy, which is that it is a set of specific regulation which is concerned with ensuring um, market comp competition remains unhindered and that market power does not serve a few particular actors or firms. 
So um, the idea here is to prevent the distortion of the competitive process. Following this, I think it's important to mention that all uh, competition policies evolve in a specific historical and ideological context, and their efficacy is based on other subset of policies, including tax law, IP law, labor market regulation, and so on. So for example, the evolution of US um, antitrust is quite different from the experience in the EU. However, there are two analytical pillars on which uh, the entire body of competition policy broadly hinges on. One is market definition, that is how a market is defined. So what distinguishes market X from market Y? And second is an assessment of market dominance. So investigating how much power the firm has in a market. This is important because dominance is distinct from abuse of dominant position. So the idea here is that it's fine to be dominant as long as the abuse of that position is not taking place. Um, then I think it's important to mention that competition policy is actually many things. Um, it is integral part of industrial policy. It is a policy of planning uh, that is preempting markets and societies in the future. Um, it determines which um, organizations can legally build scale and what they are allowed to do within the rules of fair market conduct. Um, finally, it's also important to remember the contemporary context briefly. Since the 1970s, there has been the rise of global value chains or the internationalization of production. And the problem of how to regulate multinational companies has uh, come to surface, and that's a global phenomenon. At the same time, there is the rise of financialization uh, with a few institutional shareholders and passive investors uh, controlling multiple firms. And a big challenge for competition policies is how to address this financialization in a way um, that competition is ensured. Finally, uh, and importantly, this, uh, there are linkages of firms in developing countries. So uh, competition is not simply a problem uh, associated with uh, companies based in the North, but there are also companies which are based in the developing South, which have extensive linkages with international financial institution, banks and firms, um, and they continue to hold a very big, um, to continue to exercise a, a lot of power in those countries. Um, now, considering what is um, different about uh, contemporary tech monopolies, and I think a threefold analysis or is, is for me, is quite useful. First, there, uh, the question of how, how to define data, then the challenge of intellectual monopoly capitalism, and then to address the linkages between data and uh, monopolization by these companies. So a fundamental problem surrounding contemporary tech monopoly uh, companies is um, identifying the proprietary basis of data which in turn is a problem of defining data and how it is produced. So uh, this paper by Savona in 2019 is very interesting because she categorizes data into three things. So data as intangible capital, data as labor, and data as intellectual property. Um, and this is interesting because it's based on functionality. So data as intangible capital emphasizes redistribution of data through the question of ownership which links it to taxation. Data as labor seeks to shift power from firms towards um, wage holders, so giving power to workers, um, and then identifying how um, what is appropriated from them. Finally, data as intellectual property is looking at data as a licensable asset owned by individuals who generate it. So this is a very also a very clear definition in terms of um, uh, you know, empowering individuals to own their data. Moving on, I think the concept of intellectual monopoly rents was extensively discussed uh, by Cecilia in the previous um, presentation. So I'm just going to uh, focus on this uh, definition, which is intellectual property emerges from where products derived um, uh, from intangibles are controlled by the custodians of those intangibles. Um, and to understand what's different about uh, the contemporary turn or the nature of um, monopoly today, I think is 
to understand how intellectual monopolies um, uh, uh, address the functionality of data. So the relational impact of that transformation can be understood through the phenomena of platformization. Before I move to the definition below, I think I want to emphasize that traditional competition policy is designed to address economic problem in a narrow sense, building from a new classical uh, economics perspective of a distinction between the social and the economic. But the very nature of tech companies um, can be understood as an accelerated emergence of the social and the economic. So competition policy is challenged to focus not simply on the consumer, but the participant. So the participant as the consumer, as the producer, as the consumer, as the producer, and so on. And this is why more competition is not the answer because new competitors are, cannot be equipped to, uh, to, to have the same kind of expertise, the algorithmic um, uh, promise to, to, to compete with the big, uh, the big uh, companies. I mean, that learning capability is simply not there because of network effects. Um, and I think this, uh, this uh, sort of all encompassing nature has been addressed by many others. So Durand describes this as techno feudalism. That is, these companies have a feudalistic control of how uh, users are uh, users operate or what they do. Uh, finally, um, uh, Kane Birch, who was here last time as well, talked about uh, techno scientific capitalism, um, just to understand this phenomenon. Um, and building on from this, and also actually keeping all of this together, because I, I this is not in contrast to to these other views, but this definition of platformization, which is used by Jose Ranjik in this very very interesting paper, uh, is very interesting to me. Um, and this is uh, a definition used by other authors, which goes something like this: that platformization is the interpenetration of the digital infrastructures, economic processes governmental frameworks of platforms in different economic sectors and spheres of life. So in this sense, platformization is actually, um, uh, you know, understood as something akin to electrification when it first started or the new, the industrialization process when it started. It's an all pervasive, dynamic and um, evolving process. Um, Building on from that, I think one way to understand the challenge of intellectual monopolies in this era of platformization, uh, this can be twofold. So using the taxonomy of intellectual monopoly rents operating within the dynamics of platformization. So the circle here shows a taxonomy of um, intellectual property rents within a, a, a sorry value chain. Um, and I'm just going to go briefly through them just to sort of give you an idea of what that means. First, there are the legal intellectual property rents, which is your standard rents. So pharma rents or IP rents, just like the vaccine issue that we're facing right now. Then there are nat vertical natural monopoly rents, which is the ability of lead instigators to capture a disproportionate share of mutual gains of cooperation, which can be derived from informational and structural asymmetries or barriers. So the authors give the example of um, Apple supply chain um, and how its management is actually uh, very different from the app developers or the consumers who are on that um, uh, or that platform. Second, there are third, there is an intangible differential rent. These can be understood as uh, rents accruing from uneven distribution of intangibles profits um, in the value chains. So this is basically about branding. Um, it's the brand, you know, it's it's not about um, it, it's not about something qualitative or some essence uh, to the service that it's being provided. It's a brand because the brand has taken over everything. So. Uh, the in this value addition by by the brand is actually overpowering everything. Finally, there is data-driven innovation rent, which is the central control of data generated along value chains via asymmetric information systems. So an, an example could be Amazon's ability to leverage the history of its users to then provide targeted advertising. Um, these are then mediated by the three taxonomy of platformization. First, vertical integration of 
uh, platforms, which refers to the platformization of infrastructure. It's basically the transformation of digital infrastructure into a service model such that it erodes the boundaries between infrastructures, the public and the private um, platforms. And uh, once again, you can think about the examples of tech companies building entire cities and uh, you know, basically changing the entire ecosystem of, um, of infrastructure. Second, there is a infrastructuralization of intermediary platforms, which refers to the uh, restrictive and ex exclusive nature of platforms. So Facebook, you know, you have to, if you want to, you want to sell to mass audience, you have to use Facebook, you have to use Amazon. But what is important here is the interdependency of the big five players. So Facebook is dependent on Apple and Google for allowing its app. Apple's iCloud is built on Amazon. And finally, Rodrigo just mentioned this aspect of financialization of tech and what that financialization does for the big five altogether. And I'm sure he can give you a, a better um, picture of what happens afterwards and you can read the report. Finally, there is a cross-sectorization of platforms, which simply uh, refers to um, how you know, these companies are present in so many fields. So Amazon is in, involved in uh, the medical industry, in the logistic industry, um, uh, you know, moving towards retail, um, all kinds of things. Um, overall, I think the, this, this interplay between um, these uh, monopolistic rents and the phenomena of platformization is actually talking about something very important, which is uh, this aspect of competition come coordination. That is, there is, of course, um, competition among uh, these players. However, there is a very... Um, I think very um, fluid dynamic of coordination, which allows them to act in an actually a very um, oligop oligopolistic manner, I would say. Um, and of course, there is this aspect of governance, you know, uh, different uh, competition between the US and the Chinese platforms and what they do um, in terms of, um, you know, leveraging or building on from each other's powers. Um, now I'm just going to quickly move to the limits of competition policies looking at the EU's Digital Markets Act. Um, so in 2020, the European Commission proposed the Digital Markets Act, um, which was uh, actually put forward in conjunction with the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act is looking at uh, illegal content, um, moderating of uh, platforms uh, or companies um, illegal activities, uh, trans transparency in advertising and so on, but the Digital Markets Act is exclusively concerned with ensuring uh, a high degree of competition is made. So how the, 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 law, the Act addresses this problem of um, uh, concentration is by looking, introducing this idea of digital gatekeepers, which is basically defined as a platform um, that operates in one or more of the digital world's eight core services. It's present in at least three EU countries and it has three quantitative thresholds. So first there is this eternal market um, uh, threshold, which is 6.5 billion. Then there is um, uh, this ability to have uh, X number of users as a gateway for business. Then there is uh, the, the idea of durability or the number of years in which these um, uh, uh, companies are present and how long they operate for. And it, this is supplemented by different qualitative assessments. Now I can't go into all of them, but I thought it's an interesting exercise to look at how the digital market acts relates to the, the rents that I just mentioned. So, I'm not going to go again in, into detail about how it's how um, defining these um, rents again, but your standard legal IP rents such as pharmaceutical patents are addressed by the DMA in very in a lot of ways. I've just look, I've just um, cited two, but overall they can be understood as potential obligations or duties as well as prohibitions. So, for example, in this context, there is um, emphasis on deleting bundled software, bundling prohibitions. Um, so basically empowering users to uh, delete bundling. So, you know, something you get on your phone and you couldn't delete previously, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, um, of course, uh, refraining from uh, failing to state users' ability to purchase elsewhere. 
uh, could be another aspect. And of course, I want to emphasize again that this is a proposed act. It's it's it you know it's not uh, implemented yet, and I and I suspect that there is going to be a lot of uh, negotiations um, and perhaps compromises before this act is implemented. In terms of vertical natural monopoly rents, um, the the DMA uh, says that the new rights of platforms business users, for example, limits on platform vending commission rents, which basically means that um, there would be a limit on how much rents the lead instigators can control. So. It could be a threshold or a percentage which they could control. At the same time, there is this prohibition of um, algorithmic leveraging of data by platforms. Um, in terms of intangible differential rents, um, this is very interesting prohibition of best offers, demands of platform users and supply pricing, which basically means app developers don't have to accept the price uh, that uh, you know, uh, tech monopolies are basically offering right now. So it allows them a lot of freedom, basically. Um, and there, of course, there is, uh, in terms of data-driven innovation rents, there is um, data portability, interoperability, basically things like allowing you to perhaps transfer data between different phones. That's not uh, possible at the moment. Um, and in that sense, I think this, um, the DMA is quite, um, comprehensive. So I think we can talk a lot more about this um, in the chat, but I just wanted to make three points here. If implemented, and again, I say, if it uh, is implemented with the letter of the law as it exists, the DMA is actually quite comprehensive, especially in comparison to a lot of other legislation that is out there. Uh, and it can help address uh, certain competition abuses. Um, However, the other the, the problem with this is that it's unable to address um, the problem of rent seeking beyond the more egregious uh, rents that it mentions. So it cannot address the infrastructural rondier nature of platforms because you have to ask the question of what is it that these platforms are selling? What is it that they're producing? And what is the value addition that they are offering? Uh, then and then again, we go back to the definition of data and who owns it and who produces it, and that's I mean that is not resolved yet. Um, so if you think about the status quo of data, this remains unchanged. So for example, under European law, um, you know uh, the GDPR, for example, allows you uh, to have control of your data as a as a user or a consumer, but you cannot sell it. Um, at the same time companies can harvest your data and they can then uh, use that data, rights to that data in, all, in the databases and then um, you know, uh, extract leverage and value from it. So this uh, fundamental uh, sort of um, dissonance dichotomy, whatever you call it, that has not been resolved and it's, it's, it still remains there. Um, I think I have now, uh, yeah. I think I will stop. I'll stop and take some questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Farwa. Um, yeah. So uh, last time we ended with uh, a question from Cecilia Rica for you, and one of my own questions was very much related to her question. So uh, maybe we can start with that. Um, so my question would be to what extent uh, the regulation or the lack of regulation of big tech monopolies in one part of the world, like the US or uh, the EU, like you mentioned with the, uh, with the act, um, to what extent does it lead to a waterbed effect in other parts of the world, like uh, the entrenchment of monopolies uh, in parts of the global south where regulation is still lacking? And Cecilia's question was, uh, do you agree that we need global regulation to regulate big tech monopolies, especially to uh, prevent this waterbed effect if it's indeed there? Yes, I think um, I mean, that this is a very... This is a very important question because if you think about the DMA Act, it's it, when I say it's comprehensive and it's important, it's actually targeting U.S. companies because the EU does not have that big companies uh, on its own. So in a way, it it supports this idea of fortress Europe, but it cannot address the the intellectual uh, extraction the extraction in global value chains. 
And for that to happen, there has to be a regulative, regulatory body, which is global um, and, and addresses, uh, you know, what's happening outside, uh, outside the EU. So it has to be a combination of domestic uh, regulation as well as global regulation. And then we, of course, we have to decide which bodies are going to be able to do that especially considering that we already have the UN in place um, and it's meant to do certain things which, you know, um, happen or not happen for different reasons. So just one follow-up question. Uh, would we need a different type of regulator, like uh, not the UN, but perhaps a new kind of organization? Or do you think that the current institutional framework is, is uh, well-equipped enough to regulate big tech on a global level? Well, I think then I think that for this question, we also have to consider that, um, you know, the, the fact that competition policy alone is not enough to regulate uh, these companies, because uh, as you and I were both in this uh, talk on WTO's new e-commerce uh, uh, regulation uh, and how it actually leaves developing countries in a position which is worse than before. Um, so the question of which international body is the main regulatory body? Uh, you know that is, I mean, that is actually not uh, addressed even with the existing traditional productive regulation, uh, industri industrial regulation. So, tech, the tech industry is entirely different. But uh, you know, the the I think I, it's not a question of uh, the current body or the new body. It's which actors will ultimately decide what is happening in their national domains. Sorry, just a follow-up question. Could you explain why uh, developing countries are worse than before uh, under these new proposals from the WTO? Well, actually, these proposals have just been... Uh, uh, the, a consensus has been reached on uh, e-commerce rules. Uh, and just like the imposition of certain tariffs and policies uh, uh, in the past when the whole industrial policy framework was being implemented, uh, developing countries were in a position where they were not protected domestically from um, you know, the, the vulnerable shocks of, um, of the global of, uh, markets. Um, and basically, so one, one, one way of looking at it is that a lot of competition policies in civil law countries or elsewhere are not actually that advanced. Uh, they're not equipped to deal with what is coming their way in terms of uh, you know, tech regulation or, uh, you know, how uh, certain uh, certain e-commerce is, uh, is linking with their existing platforms, whatever they may be. Um, Sarah, if I may, I would like to take a, a, a different question. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so... And thanks also on behalf of Cecilia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I have um, a question also a bit related to the presentation of uh, Cecilia Ricap last week. Um, so I, I really like how you present this typology of, of different rents and how this can be addressed uh, uh, through different types of uh, regulation. And, and you, I think you clearly show what, uh, yeah, what is missing there. But um, I, have, I have another part that may be missing, uh, and I would like to see how that fit, how that could be part of of, the, of a new regulatory approach. And that is what uh, Cecilia Ricap discussed last week uh, on, uh, yeah, on these these intellectual monopolies that are not simply dominating a certain market or product, but they. Uh, essentially, they dominate the whole infrastructure that is required to create new intangible assets. So the, the whole uh, infrastructure of knowledge production. Uh, and so th 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 these are self-enforcing monopolies. So, th so it's, they are a, a moving target in that sense. So you, you can see them in one aspect of dominating a particular market, but underlying is, is this dominance of the whole infra infrastructure to, to generate new intangibles. So how could that part that uh, Cecilia well, regarded as really the essence of these new uh, monopolies, how could that part be addressed from the EU? Uh, and as, as 
also because you rightly said that well, in the EU we don't have any any big tech firms. Uh, I mean, they are in China and in the US. So, what role is there really for the for the for the EU to step into that void? Yeah, I, I mean, this is um, I guess this gets to the heart of the limitation of traditional competition policies, because as I mentioned, it's a competition policy has to preempt the future. And in this case, we, we can clearly see that if an effective wedge is not uh, uh, you know, drawn here, or if these, the power of these companies is not controlled, uh, you know, this could lead to a, probably a very, um, you know, uh, or dystopia uh, in, term, in, in many ways. Um, so I think, uh, and, and, and the, as I said, the, the DMA is designed to uh, address the more egregious rents, but it, it is not addressing the infrastructural nature of the, of the, of the rentier um, platforms. Um, so in terms of what to do about them, I think they're the, the idea that is being popular in the US, in the UK, even in the EU is this idea of essential facilities doctrine that some of these companies are providing services which are essential and therefore they have to go in the public domain. Um, and that would entail um, thinking about IP as something which has to go away basically. You know, if internet is considered a human rights uh, or, or something which is um, freely available in a lot of now countries, I think the same approach has to be used towards the services that these companies provide, especially remembering that, uh, as I said earlier, that what these companies um, offer or the value addition that they offer is actually very little. So the number, you know, the famously the number of employees hired by WhatsApp was, you know, I don't know how many there were, like 30 employees or something like that. But look at the valuation of this company. So, um, you know, and of course, most of them, most of these, all, but actually all of these companies were funded by the U.S. U.S. state, um, and that the potential for other companies to become that big does not exist today because that kind of funding is no longer available to them. You know. So keeping these concerns in mind, I think um, having a public case for these companies is actually not uh, a very radical solution right now. Uh, shall I take over? Good. So yeah, I think my question now is also related to what you just said, because uh, we've seen in the COVID crisis that those uh, big tech monopolies have even strengthened their power, right? They tremendously profited uh, from, from another big digital leap. Uh, and of course, uh, prevention is uh, better than cure. So we should think about how we want to uh, regulate new technologies and new uh, tech companies. But we have those big companies now, like Google and Apple and Facebook. Uh, and I was discussing this with, uh, with Jeremy, uh, also from Crash Course, uh, whether splitting those companies would solve the main problems or not. Some people say that that's a good idea. Others say... That's not enough to solve the fundamental problems and we need more radical measures. What's your opinion there? And then I, if there's time, I have one follow-up question related to this topic. Yeah, um, yeah, this is very popular right now. Um, and I think splitting big tech companies may have positive effects on uh, increasing competition. But there are certain issues with that. First, that um, the merged entities such as Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp do not necessarily directly compete with each other, uh, nor do such mergers directly impede concurrent use of competing products, such as use of WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal by the same user for different purposes. Uh, and this is because digital products and their markets differ significantly from the traditional product markets. Competition regimes were, that competition regimes were, were created to regulate. So splitting may impede the rampant growth of big tech um, and, you know, stop this uh, into becoming this um, uh, global, I guess, phenomena. But the required regulation will have to have certain competition aspects, but equally it will need to deal with consumer protection, uh, data rights, uh, pricing controls, um, and the delineation of essential facilities from the marketable products of big tech companies. 
Yeah. So I think with that, actually, you answered my second question, because that was whether uh, the required regulation is a form of competition policy or uh, a different terrain. But you say competition policy is not enough, right? We, we yeah. Different forms of policy uh, to achieve the goals of uh, either splitting, but also curbing uh, the, the rise of new big tech companies. Yeah, I think I think um, from a political economy perspective, there has to be a, a rethink of what uh, competition policy is and what it can do. Because if you think about competition policy, it looks at monopoly as the end goal. So suddenly there is this, uh, you know, everything is nice and quiet and suddenly there is a monopoly situation. And the job of the competition policies address that problem of uh, concentration and monopoly. Whereas if you think about a critical structuralist uh, uh, perspective, you know, competition and monopoly are the very essence of how capitalism operates. You know, there are there is this this uh, sort of dynamic where competition and um, uh, and monopoly coexist and they continue to inter to, to, to have this interplay. Um, and you know you have certain mergers and certain con co certain companies are destroyed, but um, the subordinate companies or the smaller companies, you know, they have a specific role. However, the big companies, you know, they're almost untouchable. So in a way, it sort of also goes back to this idea of the Gilded Age and what happened at that time. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, we shift also to benefit those smaller companies uh, because they're uh, suffering actually from from the current regulation in the way you say because that's focused on, on monopoly as a goal in itself yeah um i think it's it's time to go to the q a session of participants sarah um yeah we have at least two questions there and i think someone from crash course also posed the question so yeah let's but let's let's start and maybe let's start yeah uh, that we we still have time to uh go through them uh quietly and we don't need to rush through them so um first question uh is uh, I'll, I'll i'll just read it out uh, loud but uh farmer you, you can also read it in the q a Oh, okay. Um, so the first question is by uh, Stefan Roelvink. Uh, and his question is, um, online platforms increasingly provide services and products that we can regard as public utility services. Would you say that therefore competition law or DMA would become more effective if we start perceiving certain platforms as public utility companies, uh, as is happening in uh, telecommunication, electricity, and water? So it's, it's yeah, you already partly address this, but maybe you could um, well, continue on that. Yeah, maybe just to add, so Stefan is a researcher at the Ratano Institute, which is a technology institute. So I, I think, or perhaps he's already preoccupying himself also with those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Just, there are two things. First, uh, what the DMA is designed to do, um, and then this idea of these companies becoming public utilities. At the time, DMA is not addressing them as essential facilities or public utilities, looking at them as private entities and trying to regulate them. Once they are in the public domain, I think um, the legislation would have to be changed. Um, and you know, the the most a lot of problems associated with their rontier behavior, of course, would be very different if they are um, if you're talking about essential facilities. So. Um, you know, uh, certain a uh, certain uh, social services or uh, in a country are provided as monopoly. You know, um, so that that angle would have to be taken to look at them. I'm not sure if that answers answers your question, but the DMA is a very narrow uh, approach to how to these companies and trying to. Uh, it, trying to control their power, building on a lot of uh, EU case study law. Uh, and this is why it's very comprehensive because it's actually looking at a lot of cases which used which were encountered by um, by the EU in the past. So it's, it's it is restrictive in that manner, but but you have to but you have to say that it's very comprehensive. Hmm. So and uh, yeah, if if I may um, have a follow up question on that, um, 
isn't isn't and going back to the, to this question of uh, the concentration and the political economy or the international political economy actually the concentration of these big tech firms in the US and China uh, and the absence of them in, in the EU uh, yeah doesn't it mean that the if if we would like to regard these uh, the, the services that these big tech companies provide as as utilities as as rights as uh, well, something resembling electricity and access to clean water, uh, and this is something that should be uh, should originate in the U.S. and China, uh, and cannot be pushed forward by uh, well powers outside it. Or what what type of forum or international organization would be able to well to push such a, a solution? If 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 we see that as a solution, what what type of uh, movement could push that forward, in your opinion? Um, maybe certainly not the old ones, because they're not doing it. Um, so I, if, if I understand your question, first, there is the, the fact that these are being produced in the US and China and not elsewhere. Um, in fact, I think, not just to, un, not to address your question directly, but what's something very interesting is happening, which is that a lot of technological innovation, as they call it, is now being funded by venture capitalists or, um, you know, this, this new kind of funding model, which is actually not designed to support innovation or technological progress per se, but uh, deepening the, the process of platformization. So, you know, you have platforms which are now providing more uh, drivers to deliver food. Um, that's not really innovative in, its, in the sense that it's not, it's just yet another platform. Um, and then it, it, and the model is, is such that it might be very, very powerful or um, very profitable for a few years. And then there are more competitors and then it's just, it's just buy it out or something like that. Um, so in that sense, the kind of... Um, platforms, the kind of companies that are emerging in developing countries is quite different from the ones that we already have because they simply cannot compete. Um, but in terms of then information, data, knowledge, uh, sh sh uh, the sharing aspect becoming global, um, it cannot happen unless that knowledge is democratized until, until IP is gone away. Um, and, you know, it has to be a lot of information, a lot of um, knowledge that was part of making of Apple, Google, Facebook was public universities, for example. Uh, and we can't even talk about public universities in the state of tech innovation studies in a lot of developing countries simply because that kind of uh, uh, resources do not exist. So if there is to be knowledge transfers, then it has to be free of cost, you know. Actually, it's very much similar to this phenomenon of um, uh, vaccines that, you know, that we see today. So it's not, in some ways, actually, the whole idea of tech Monopolies is not very different in terms of what's happening. It's just that it's a very accelerated phenomenon which has reoriented uh, the traditional boundaries of what public and private was in the past. Yeah, thanks. That's a very interesting answer. And I see that there's more questions being uh, posed in the Q&A tab. So the next one is by uh, Miriam van der Stiegelen. Uh, and she writes, there are cooperation agreements between competition policy authorities bilaterally and an international competition network. Should cooperation be extended to tackle tech in the broadest approach? UNCTAD, which is um, the UN organization working on uh, trade and development. So UNCTAD had or has a platform on restricting business practices resulting from international competition agreement. Could it be a discussion forum to start with, including the global south? What do you think, Farmer? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and and I think um, you see you see this question appearing in many forms with this idea of digitalization and uh, uh, the rise of uh, you know tech tech cooperation south south cooperation in different ways, and the UN is also looking at it. Uh, I mean, if it has to be done through UNCTAD or any other UN body. It has to ensure that developing countries have an equal voice. Um, and first of all, that their competition policies are strong enough to address um, or to understand even what the 
uh, you know, companies like Amazon are going to do in their jurisdictions. Because actually, when Amazon comes into developing countries and allows third parties to operate on their platform, it's often not clear what's hap- going to happen to these uh, companies. Uh, and this is the case with countries which already have their own e-commerce platform, but also those which actually have no idea um, of what an e-commerce platform would do for them. So all these concerns have to be very clearly spelled out, I think. And sorry, if, 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 if I may, um, in, in your, what, what you see, uh, uh, as academic, as, as campaigner, also, do you think that sufficient re- resources or research is being done into the into these specific needs and problems of developing countries, or do you think this is something that really, well, the more research in this area is, is clearly needed? I think, yeah, I think, um, I guess what you're talking about is understanding the impact of monopolies in the global south and tech monopolies specifically. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a new area of research. And, um, you know, I don't know, I don't think that a lot of institutions or activists or researchers are looking at it. Uh, in fact, I mean, the duration is also interesting because, you know, we didn't see this kind of exacerbation of the problem before the COVID crisis. It's only with the COVID crisis that people are aware of the scale, you know, when the stock market is well, it's always been dissonant, but now it's extremely dissonant from what's happening on the ground. So uh, I, I don't think there is enough research on it. And I, and I think this requires um, a study on multiple fronts, you know, not just competition policy, but there is also a social aspect of um, what's happening with the proliferation of tech in, in countries where these things never existed. Yeah, so now we're moving slightly to uh, the more utopian uh, perspective, I think. And the next question is by uh, Thomas T. Uh, and the question is, are there positive alternatives that challenge these big tech platforms? Or is the exploitative nature of these platforms inherent in their model? Uh, and then he writes, I think Fair BNB exists and attempts to be a more positive alternative to Airbnb. Would you agree with that, Farwa? I don't know what fair BNB is, but it seems fairer than Airbnb. So I, I, yeah, I, can't. I think it's a fair variant of, of Airbnb. And I think it's also related to refugees, perhaps, but I'm not 100% sure. It, but it's, it's, it's a good thing. That's for sure. Yeah, it seems that, you know, Airbnb are, are charging these. Um, well, actually, they've challenged the whole tourist industry, haven't they? Uh, but they are extracting rents on their own. So that is quite interesting that they've destroyed, they've called, almost destroyed this traditional um, hotel chain industry, but they're, they're extracting in their own right. So it seems fair BNB is not charging those prices. Um, yeah, once again, I think it depends on how much space these companies can have for themselves, how they can build that, uh, how they can maneuver that space. Um, and right now, I think, um, of course, there are a lot of people who are interested in, in challenging uh, tech companies, but the tech companies are constantly innovating against um you know the their projects or innovations so it's a constant battle but um, um i think it has to start from a position where there has to be control on these companies and then an expansion of alternatives um yeah that's that's my answer yeah so it's rather yeah, first curbing and then building the new structures um i think we're, we have time for one or two more questions um well i think well one definitely so let's let's start with that one uh so um another question by Oron diba consultancy uh, like railways and postal services uh, they were nationalized when they became part of the social structure so is it not only is it not the only solution to make these companies public services we have addressed this um sometimes uh, but maybe you have something else to mention about this yeah it, um i think it's it has to be a, a twofold uh solution so first um, it, um essential services um domestically and but also looking at their global impact um so you know for example um 
China has imposed, uh, I think, a 2.8 billion fine on Alibaba but just recently. Um, and, you know, the, the fact is that the writ of the state in China is much larger than that which is available in, which is possible in other countries. So this is their competition policies geared towards the role of the state. Um, but that is just the China model. Um, but still, what does Alibaba or what can Alibaba do in, in other countries outside China? You know, this is this this is not in the jurisdiction of uh, Chinese law, for example. So it has to be complemented by um, regulation on an international level as well as uh, essential facilities on a domestic level. So just just a follow up question. Um, well, it's a bit unfair because. Uh, Closing, closing all the doors to a, a, a happy ending. But um, so, if we think of uh, seeing these uh, services as a utility and and, and the, the need to nationalize them, so that wouldn't we then be placed with the danger of well of the state acting as big brother? Uh, we see the surveillance state in, in China, and of course, uh, the US is is not a, um, is, is a big surveillance state of its own, uh, with the NSA globally, uh, part of the military industrial complex, and so on. So, so it seems that on the one hand we have these corporate monopolies, and on the other hand we have this well, not a uh, fully transparent uh, and democratic states controlling this power um is is that really the only choice that we have you think yeah and this is i mean this is um of course this is very problematic and this is why i i mention uh domestic regulation as well as international regulation um because there has to be some external global um uh, uh you know a global body to regulate what's happening at the domestic level especially considering that you know, platformization is a global phenomenon. So in fact, it, this could have spillover effects as well. Um, so it has, you know, there is, this is not either or, it has to be a two-way thing. Uh, and of course it, it, you know, it remains to be seen if that is a possibility or what come, comes out of it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Farwa. I do think we need to uh, close up um so let me thank you uh so much for your presentation today and i also think you really brought the discussion one step further because we've been really going to depth of uh regulatory dilemmas and the question of competition policy whether it's enough or not and if it's not enough what kind of policy do we need so that's really bringing uh our our thinking i think uh, a step further which is um I think a very uh, positive development in the sense that we're getting closer and closer to solutions. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, the recording of the whole webinar will be put online uh, as well as a podcast version thereof. Uh, and there will be also uh, show notes if there's any article or blog post for you would like to share with our attendees or other people that visit the platform, um, please send it to us and we'll put it online there. Uh, and I'd like to thank all attendees for participating um, in the uh, Crash Course webinar today on Big Tech. Um, the next one is on the 3rd of June uh, at four o'clock again. It will last one hour. And it's with uh, Nandini Chami uh, on Big Tech and the Global South, with, which we've been discussing today already a bit. And Nandini is the Deputy Director at uh, IT for uh, Change. And I wanted to ask you, Farwa, um, is there a question you'd like to ask Nandidi, maybe related to the topic, which is big tech and the consequences for the global south? Yeah, I mean, I've followed Nandini's work. It's, it's great. Um, I just want, I was just interested in her answers of, regu of this regulating big tech in India. Um, and actually, where does she see the influences on um, India's regulatory response coming from? Um, because I'm, I'm sure it's not just the US or the EU. I think they could have uh, multiple influences. And then, of course, uh, what she has to say, I'm generally very interested in what she has to say. All right, great. Thanks a lot. And we'll uh, start off with that question the next time. Um, if you want to join Farwa, please do. And all other uh, viewers, uh, please be invited for the next session. Uh, last but not least, I'd just like to show you our website. Um, one second. 
So here's our website designed by uh, Jeremy. It's a uh, crash course economics.org. Uh, if you go there, you can see here the fourth episode with Nandini. You can sign up over here, the sign up now button. And then if you go all the way to the bottom, you can also sign up here for our newsletter just by clicking on it. Um, and that's it for now. So I hope to see you uh, again. Um, webinar will be put online. Um, I'm happy to say that we've managed to answer all the questions. Uh, I'd like to thank you once more, Farwa, for your very um, lucid presentation. Um, if you're okay with it, we'll put also your slides online, but we'll, uh, we'll ask you uh, after the session. Um, a lot of people are saying thank you so much uh, in the chat. Um, and team Rodrigo, thank you so much for uh, this successful session and hope to see you in two weeks time or 